Which brings us to the Indian military. You can track history through the evolution of warfare. Gone are the days when battles dragged on for years. Today's battles are instant. It's all about striking swiftly and stealthily. And to do this, you need to check two boxes. One is instant decision making and the second is state of the art weaponry. Tonight we tell you where India stands on these two indicators. How does the chain of command work in India? Is there scope for improvement? And what about our weapons? Can they keep up with the rest of the world? Let's talk about the chain of command first. India's defense is split into three services. You may know that. The Air Force, the Navy and the Army. And they have their own headquarters, their own bases, their own leadership. It's been this way for decades. But this system has drawbacks. There's a lot of duplication of work. Unnecessary bureaucracy. Let me explain with an example. The Indian airspace is defended by all three services. They are tracking threats on separate frequencies with their own radars. But here's the problem. Every army headquarters is located next to an airbase. So two agencies are doing the same work sitting right next to each other. Think about the wastage of resources and manpower. I'll give you another example. Imagine the army is on a combing operation. The in charge, the commander in charge wants some air support. So he calls up the Air Force, which in turn will then churn this request through its ranks. Do you see the problem here? The person in charge of an operation does not have complete control over the assets. And this was the story every time India went to war. The Air Force had its own plan, the army was doing its own thing, but modern war machines cannot function like this and India is realizing this. The defense establishment is moving towards what is called theaterization. This is how the US and China organize their forces. In India, there is talk of five commands. The Northern Command to deal with China, the Western Command on the Pakistani side, a Peninsula Command in Southern India, a Maritime Command to patrol the seas and an Air Defense Command to protect the airspace. Five commands for India. So how is this different from the current setup? The commands are unified establishments, which means the Army, the Navy and the Air Force will function together under one command. No more shuttling between agencies for orders. All three services will answer to one single commander. In military circles, they call this jointness and integration. But will this work in India? We put this question to retired Rear Admiral Rakesh Chopra earlier today and he says jointness is as much about the mindset as the organization. Served in the uh, uh, IDS, the Integrated Defense Headquarters, and uh, you know it, it, it is a marvelous concept. Provided we take it to its logical conclusion, you need people who think jointly. That's the main problem. You need people who can look at the problem from a from a joint perspective, and this can only come if you have people who have served in in joint appointments. We've, you know, had even starting from the from the NDA to the Staff College, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to the NDC to certain formations which are joint, which have got all assets, all of the three services, then people can understand. But if you have a, uh, if you have people looking after their own turf, then this of course will not come. So the integrated defence headquarters is the ideal place for jointness to start. India cannot underestimate this mindset problem. The three services are used to autonomy. So we cannot assume that they will get along on cue. Both the Air Force and the Navy fear that the Army will dominate joint commands. This could lead to a turf war, a territorial battle for assets, for funds, for influence. The other big challenge is logistics. If you appoint a commander, what happens to the chiefs of staff? Do the soldiers still report to them or will commanders take over operational control? Same with the assets. The Air Force has only 31 squadrons. Can they spread their assets wide enough to support every command? These are some of the big challenges to joint theatres. How do we handle them? How do others handle them? The United States, for instance. It has a tried and tested system, but India cannot copy the American system. India's tri-service chief has ruled this out. General Bipin Rawat says India will develop in its own system of joint theatres. 
So what is it going to look like? The military is tight-lipped about the plans, but reports say they should be operational by next year. And hopefully this will solve the bottlenecks in decision-making. What about the weapons? An army, we are told, is only as good as the weapons it has. And this is where India has struggled in the past with outdated weapons, aircraft and ships. The only way to overhaul this is through defence spending. Now on paper, India is the third largest spender in the world, behind the United States and China. But it's not about how much you spend, it's about where you spend that money. Look at the breakup of India's defence budget. 50% of the funds go to salaries and pensions. So at the start of every month, half the money is already gone. Where does that leave India's modernization plans? These are figures from this year's budget. The total allocation was 4.78 lakh crore rupees. After pensions and salaries and other expenses, guess how much is left for modernization? 1.35 lakh crore rupees, just 28% of the total budget. For a country with two belligerent neighbors, this is simply inadequate. So what are India's options here? One is to keep expanding the defence bill, but as this pandemic has shown us, India needs to put more money in public health and infrastructure too at the moment. So a big defence bill could be highly unpopular given the circumstances. What about reforming pensions? Maybe extend the retirement age of officers. Every time someone suggests this, there's a backlash from veterans. And the situation is not getting any better. We need active deployments in the East and West, which means more soldiers, more salaries, more pensions. Where will all of this money come from? A viable option then is to trim the loose ends, streamline acquisitions, cut down on duplication of work. So I come back to jointness and integration. Right now, every service has its own wish list. There is no synergy between them on acquisitions. The goal is to get them all together so that India's defence establishment has one wish list, not three. I mean, this, is the, this is the job of the Integrated Defence Headquarters, to have a look at these wish lists. And then to, because there, and these are all officers from the three services, to discuss and see what is really necessary and make priorities, in consultation with the services, of course. You see, if we already have a mechanism provided, we let we let the mechanism work. That is the question, you know. And it's just not uh, that I, you know, so-and-so service wants so-and-so thing, and therefore, you know, it it uh, it, it sort of bamboozles everybody else. But all decisions on procurement, etc., should ideally be passed through the integrated defence headquarters. All of this is easier said than done, of course. The bureaucrats are sure to oppose a unified command. They hate being sidelined. Also, be ready for squabbles between generals, admirals and air marshals, perhaps. But these worries should not concern India very much because unification of command is like a rebirth for the military. Every big power has gone through it and they're better off with the new system. Vion is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.